sort of well, chap are you, really? What would, what, how would you sum yourself up? Ah, uh, someone... Someone who's not afraid to have a go. Uh, a, a typical Sagittarian. To hell with the consequences, let's give it a go. Hopefully it comes off. If you hadn't become a cricketer, where would you have gone, do you reckon? Probably next door to Reggie Cray. <laughs> <laughs> For Worcestershire County Cricket Club, 1988 was most decidedly a season to remember. Under Basil D'Oliveira's tutelage, a youngish side dusted out the trophy cupboard and almost filled it. Worcestershire were county champions for the first time since 1974. They won the Refuge Assurance League and were runners-up in two one-day competitions. Old names were evoked at New Road, Don Kenyon, Tom Graveney, Dolly himself, and comparisons drawn with a new stroke maker, Graham Hick. Ian Terence Botham, Both or Beefy to his mates, sat out most of the season, recovering from an operation to fuse two vertebrae in his back. Ironically, after 14 years playing county cricket, first with Somerset and then Worcester, the great all-rounder won his first championship medal watching from the pavilion. Don't be in any doubt, Both would rather have been in the thick of it. And for us, the entertainment would have been all the richer. But the back operation restricted him to a mere four county games in 1988. At his Worcestershire cottage, we began our interview by reflecting back to the choice before him as a teenager. What would it be? Cricket or soccer? The thing I think at the end of the day is that I took a gamble at 15 into cricket, and it's paid dividends. Did anything prod you into doing that, into making that gamble? No, I had a chat with my father. Um, you know, it's obviously for a 15 year old kid, it's you know, a confusing time. And I said to him quite bluntly, I said, What do you think um, I'm best at? And he said, Well, it's the effect, I think whatever you want to do, you'll do. And that was basically his advice. And um, so perhaps I owe a lot to him. He never tried to push me in any direction. Your headmaster at school wasn't so confident, I gather. No, no, but he was a Welshman. <laughs> I can remember one day he had me in. Yeah, Ryan right. had me in his office quite often, but he had me in there one day and he said to myself and a friend, you, know, you two guys, he says, you'll never do anything with your lives. You'll be wasters for as long as you live. And about three or four years later, the two of us took great delight in going back and uh, selling a bottle of champagne across the bar. Ian Botham first gets a mention in the cricket books in 1973, playing a couple of one-day games for Somerset. The following summer, aged 18, he took one on the jaw from Andy Roberts in a Benson and Hedges quarter-final against Hampshire. It was just so much quicker than anything else I'd ever seen before. Uh, it was a little bit like stepping from the Southern League to the First Division in soccer terms. You know, suddenly I was with the big boys. And this flew by, you know, this, this ball just got to about here. Instantly I went here, I don't know, I tried to sort of duck hook it or whatever. And it hit me here, which... The impact then on my jaw knocked two teeth out here straight away, and on the recoil, two came out this side in sympathy, and the ball then ricocheted and grazed me or cut me up here. Young Both battered on for a match-winning 45 not out, and his first pat on the back. Can you remember the first test you played? Yes, Trent Bridge, 1977. Mm. Five for 70 of 
Yeah. And the first wicket was Craig Chappell. With a long hop? Well, that's how some might describe it. I find it as, for one of my first balls in the second, uh, second spell, it was one of the best balls I've ever bowled in it. <laughs> but no, it was a little bit short, it wasn't quite on line, and he thought it was Christmas, and I'll smash this out the ground and got an inside edge on the stump. Ever since then, I knew I'd be, I'd be lucky in Test cricket. Bosom to Marsh, LBW for a duck. Two runs later, Bosom got his fourth wicket. Walker caught low down by the inevitable Hendrick. It was a fine debut for the young Somerset all-rounder. He finished with five for 61 on a wicket that didn't much help him. He bowled with both fire and intelligence. He did it again in the next test. Marsh scooped up by Knott. Botham took five for 21. Thompson was on the wrong end of a late swinger, and so the Ashes were regained. Have you ever been tempted to sign for Packer? No. No. Your loyalties then are still with England? Well, I, I want to play for England. Um, I want to see the world playing for England, or as much of it as possible. And I've still got a long way to go yet around the world. And uh, I don't think there's any greater honour than playing for your country. It was in New Zealand that Botham confirmed his promise as an all-rounder. Well, this the gives and a catch. There's a loud appeal and he's given him out. It's a clean catch taken by Botham at fourth slip. Aside from his agility in the field, he got his maiden test century at Christchurch and had the gall in the second innings to run out Geoffrey Boycott. And it's taken by Botham, and it's all over. Boycott said, right, we've, well, we've got to go for it. And uh, we talked him into, you know, we'd go out and just throw the bat. Because it left us one day then to bowl him out. So he goes out there, says, right, we'll smash it around. And after 12 hours, Boycott was six not out. And we were something like 30 for three. And we wanted to be really... 60 for three. And I was next in, being promoted after getting 100 in the first place, promoted up the order. And that's, so I said to the lads, this is no good. It's, yeah, something will happen. I said, don't leave your seats. And I went out there and I called Boyks, yes, no, sorry. And as Jeff walked by, he said, Ian, what have you done? You see, and it didn't speak to me for about 48 hours. <laughs> but uh, we laugh about it now and joke about it. And as it turned out, it worked well because uh, we got the run that we needed and won the game by three o'clock the next afternoon. At the age of 24, Ian Botham became the youngest England captain this century. If you had the choice of being a captain or a player, what would you like to be? Oh, obviously the captain. That's every schoolboy's ambition, so uh, I'm very honoured to have the job and hope I can uh, hold it for a few years to come. I think I got a bit of a raw deal. Uh, I think I was just getting the hang of the job and just starting to sort it out. You know, everyone forgets I was 24 and I wasn't even captain in Somerset. I think it was naive of the people in charge to think I was going to walk in and do it overnight. On reflection, my record against the West Indies, who were as good a team then as they are now, there's no doubt about that. I lost 1-0 and 2-0. I didn't lose 5-0, 5-0. These are hard times for Botham. The Wonderboy image has deserted him after a year of indifferent form, in stark contrast to his dramatic arrival on the test scene three years ago. Those who saw him climb so quickly are now watching him fall. And there seems little doubt that his future as an England player, let alone captain, is on the line in this series. I've got to go through periods where I can't. I can't be expected to you know, just go out there and take five wickets or a hundred runs. It just doesn't happen like that. You know, I mean, Richard Richard scored in the last calendar year. You know, it works, and he's the best player in the world. So, this, you know, all I can do is go out there and try. And you know, no one can complain if you're trying. Ken Barrington's death from a heart attack during the Barbados test was a personal blow. Barrington had been both a friend and mentor. It was actually the only time that I've ever actually considered whether I didn't want to play. I felt so sort of screwed up inside and then at the end of the day I sat down and thought about it and, I, and Kenny was the assistant manager on that trip and I sat down with Alan Smith and we talked about it. And I said, Alan, oh, I don't know if I'm right to go out there, I don't know if I can lead the team out there. And uh, he, we sat there and talked about it and I suppose it's an old saying but at the end, we both considered the fact that if Kenny would want us to go out there and play it, and knowing Kenny as I did, it, he would have wanted that. And so the game went ahead, but there was players on both sides. When we had them in at silence, there was quite openly tears running down their face. And he was a much-loved man in sport. I wonder if, if, if what you were feeling then had anything to do with your 
sort of sense of frustration when Michael Holding was having a go at you with short pitch balls and you, you threw the bat down. The wicket was wet. Yeah. And it was hard, you had this wet top and it just moved the surface of it. And it wasn't very pleasant. And I actually got out of the way of some freakish delivery. And a friend of mine over there in West Indies, a cameraman, swears to this day that the ball went between my head and the helmet as I took evasive action. It just took off. So it wasn't fun. And yeah, of course I got frustrated. And I mean, you know, I mean, it's bad enough playing the West Indians on when all things were equal, but when they've got the wicket in their favour as well, it's not too much fun. And Michael was pushing off the sight screen at Barbados, coming up the hill and bowling a great, great head knock. As Jeff Boycott could tell you, yeah. his stumps went all over the place in the first over. The Ashes series at home didn't offer much solace. The promising innings at Trent Bridge was nipped in the bud. 33 in the second innings, the top English score, but the test was lost. The captain had his well wishes, but the writing was on the wall. And at Lord's, he bagged a pair. What about the atmosphere you ran into when you got the pair and went into the pavilion at Lord's? Um, it was a very long walk for me. Because obviously I had all this going on in my mind. Should I, you know, is it worth captaining England now? And I decided by the end of the day, apparently I'd beat the guillotine by minutes, but I still got in the resignation before him. We didn't need that extra pressure put on the team or myself. In their wisdom, the selectors felt that was the way they wanted to play it. As it turned out, we won the series, uh, so they must have been right. But um, it was a very long walk. It was uh, a walk that... I'll probably never forget, and I'll never forget those same faces that, over the last few years, have taken great delight. Could not even look at me. They all had their heads in the papers, and they were like this. Almost as if they'd thought it was a ghost, as if I wasn't there. It was just the ghost of the performer player going through. And I thought, oh, I'll show you, you bastards. Do you feel relieved now you've not got the job? No, not relieved. Just sad in some ways, but um, that's... It's a professional life, so you've got to take the rough with the smooth. And I, I just felt, feel that uh, it's the best for everybody. And whoever takes over the job, I wish them all the best. And I hope that uh, I can uh, be a member of that team. It's, it's terrible to have to tell people they're, they're not required, but uh, he made it a lot easier too, because he, he, he approached the whole thing as, a, as I thought he would, as a, as a man, you know. He's, he's a great chap, and... Uh, I've got every respect for him. I think he'll come back again, probably Captain England. When? Well, yeah, give him another 12 months and I think he will. Obviously, it's not easy for my wife and, and parents and in-laws and all the people that are close to me. You know, it, it started telling them, obviously, a little bit. And I, I, just, I, I just think it's hopefully it's the best thing for the game. The rest of 1981 is now part of cricket folklore. The gods started smiling on both of them again at Headingley. I should never forget that morning because Mike Brearley came up to me and said uh, that when he took over the job, he said, uh, do you want to play this game, the morning of the test? Do you want to play? I said, yes, of course I want to play, Breers. Because incidentally, Breers is the guy that I felt should have been captain the side then anyway. In fact, they said, I think you're going to get 10 wickets in this match and 150 runs. And I said, well, I hope you're right. And as it turned out, I got a few wickets and lots of runs. And to be exact, he took seven wickets in all. But it was with the bat that he unsettled Australian equanimity. With England following on over 200 behind, a carefree and unforgettable partnership developed with Graham Dilly. When you were there with Dilly, did you talk to each other? Yeah, we talked a lot. Not very much about cricket. Where are we going for a pint tonight? What do you reckon about this? Do you think it's worth hanging around? I, he said, what do you want me to do? I said, just keep hitting the ball. Uh, well, you know, there wasn't a lot. It, it seemed an impossible task. Mm. And when you go in in that situation and there's nothing, nothing to lose, everything to gain, it's very easy to do well. Yeah. And we enjoyed it. I mean, he played some, a, a great knock. Um, he played shots that 
he probably will never ever play a game in his life, Graham. And I think he'd say that in his own admittance, because he actually, I haven't been hitting the cover shots, he actually looked at me and sort of just had a silly little giggle and said, oh, I haven't done that before. <laughs> yeah. And it, uh, he loved it. It was great. It, it, was a, it was a great test match to be involved in. Botham was like a man freshly released from the stocks. With Dilly out for 56, Botham went on to an exultant century. It ended with both of them 149 not out. Australia needing 125 runs and Bob Willis building up ahead of steam. Willis took a lot of wickets mm. as well. well, well Bob you? Willis never got the uh, credit he deserved because I think mean, he got eight for 34 or 40 or something, or 44 or whatever. And uh, without that, we would still never have won that test match. It would never have then gone down as the great test of 81. Since it was Botham who'd slaughtered them with the bat, he was given first choice with the ball. Wood was about to head a procession. But today's real hero was Bob Willis, seemingly back from the dead. Hughes out to a brilliant catch by Ian Botham. Who else? Border looked certain to fall in one stupendous over from Chris Old. So Australia's two big guns had gone for ducks and suddenly really had triumph, not humiliation, staring him in the face. Could Willis, on those wonky knees, keep it up? That dreadful effort by Dyson meant that all the frontline batsmen were out for 68. And against Willis's snorting pace, Marsh lost his head as well. Dilly kept his, and it was 74 for seven. But Bright looked dangerous, hitting 10 in one over. And with a dozen no balls thrown in, the score crept to 100. Lily took it to within 20 of an Australian win before the final heart-stopping twist. Willis to Lily and watch Gatting at mid-on. With one wicket left, it was 19 to win as Willis wound himself up one more time. So, a dramatic end to what had become one of the great test matches in the game's history. We think we're a good side and hopefully we can prove it now. Do you feel now that you can claim the Ashes? Well, it wouldn't be me to say that we couldn't, would it? I know the question... We were 3-0 down with three to four to play, I still say we could do it, so obviously I think we can do it. I know the question you've been dreading people asking, but I have to ask because everybody's saying it. Well, you won't mind if I don't answer it then, will you? Well, try it. Isn't it the question first? That, uh, because I'm not, because form, I'm not captain. Yeah. Is it a coincidence or is it... Well, like I said the other night, it's the original Catch-22 situation. And I can give a monkey stuff so long as England win, and we won. That's all that worries me. He may just feel a little less inhibited, a little less tight and uptight. And he's got somebody to shield him a bit against some of the pressures. Me. Um, or whoever it had been. I don't mean me particularly. But it's an enormous pleasure to play cricket with him again, especially when he plays like this. Really did his bit with the bat in the next test. Astonishingly, Brearley's 48 made him the top scorer at Edgbaston. Again, the Australians faced a modest target, 150 runs. But this time, it was both of them who was asked to do the trick with the ball. In fact, something of a five-card trick. The Australians were cruising it, and... Uh... Breers just stood there and he said to me, he said, uh, I think you ought to have a bowl. And I said, well, you know, Embers has got a little couple of wickets. I said, what about bowling Pete Willie, just to try him for a couple and see if anything happens in Breers and, no, he said, you have a go. And I got five for one in 28 delivered. Um, and it was quite funny as Breers stood at the press conference, well, actually, he didn't want a bloody bowl. <laughs> <laughs> um, it wasn't a case of not wanting the bowl. I would just, you know, we were discussing options and... <laughs> Modesty probably prevented me from saying, yes, I should bowl captain, but no, it, it was strange, and uh, I can remember getting the um, Rod Marsh, I think it was the first of the five, he had tried to hit me out of the ground, stump me out of the ground, and there's a succession of wickets in a very short time, but the atmosphere, I'll never forget, the crowd, the buzz, it was something that, unless you were actually out there on that arena, you cannot describe, because the, the crowd just suddenly came to life. We got two wickets, got three, got four. And we had an eight or nine down. Well, the, the place you, I mean, you, 
Wembley to heart out. It was unreal. I couldn't get that last wicket and picking up the stump and running off. And, yeah, it was. The Australians have never been very good chasing small totals, though. What do you do with those stumps? I usually give them away. Usually give them away. Um, not like one of my colleagues said, I said to him, what do you do? And he said, oh, I sell them to my friends. I actually, no, I actually give them away. <laughs> The fifth test at Old Trafford, and Botham rampant again. Lily and Alderman took the brunt of it. In one over, Lily was dispatched for 22 runs. Wisden said the innings was unequaled for its ferocious and effortless power, its dazzling cleanness of stroke. Even Gilbert Jessup, batsman hitter of the early 1900s, couldn't have bettered this. The Times simply asked, was Botham's innings the greatest ever? I refuse to believe, wrote its correspondent John Woodcock, that a cricket ball has ever been hit with greater power or rarer splendour. Botham made 118. All but 30 of those runs came in boundaries. He finally fell to the left armour, Mike Whitney, making his test debut. It was virtually a faultless inning. It was a knock I enjoyed, and especially after being out first ball in the first inning. The Lancashire crowd are so knowledgeable, and uh, it was a nice, nice place to get that hundred. England duly went three up in the series and retained the Ashes. Tremendous, marvellous innings. He, he, as you said, there is, there's a shortage of words to describe it, but I think he is a giant amongst cricketers of any age. And if you took him out of our side, we'd become an ordinary side. If you put him into any other international side, they'd become a good side, as with Sobers or WG Grace, and that's a measure of his ability. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I think the turning point in the whole series has basically been Mike really coming back and allowing Ian to uh, perform as his ability has always suggested. And uh, there obviously might be several reasons for that, but he's played, and well, he's virtually won, won three games for England. We get on very well. I mean, I, I'm perhaps good for him, and he's certainly good for me. I mean, his, his robustness and his enthusiasm and his boyishness and his, and his shrewdness, I and mean, he's quite a good thinker about the game. And um, all I can say is that any catch that has him on his side is a lucky man. I don't think our performances have been that bad. I don't think England's have been that much better. I think the only difference between the whole sides in any of the in the last three games has been Ian Botham. Yes. That's all. He's been the real match winner. Yeah. Hasn't so I think I still feel that England have got as many problems as we've as we've got, but unfortunately it's just that one man. How much you'd wish to have him in your side? Yeah, and I just hope that England uh, do the right thing by him, and uh, that if and when he does fail, that people uh, accept that and get off his back and let him play the game. Because without him, I'm sure the the people and the spectators in the game will be a lot poorer off. Had he called it a day in 1981, he was then 26, Ian Botham would still have been guaranteed an eminent place in the cricketing pantheon. His all-round gifts have always set him apart as an exceptional athlete, so it seemed appropriate to discuss cricket with him skill by skill. It's a pivotal position, though, really, number six, isn't it? Number six actually is quite is a position on its own. You either you either go in at uh, three hundred for four, or you go in at thirty for four. It never seems to be a happy medium. Very rarely do you go in at you know a nice time when you go and play. You're either wanting quick runs or you're out there battling to save the innings. So it, it does take a little bit of getting used to, and then you you adapt and play accordingly. There's no set way for a number six to play. And I suppose that's probably helped me a lot. When you take guard, what, what do you actually think about? It depends who's bowling. Um, if it's the West Indians and you're playing on, which I have done, a sort of damp wicket, say in Barbados, on the first morning of the day, you're thinking, well, it'd be nice to get to lunchtime with all bones intact. And you're thinking purely survival. You're not thinking about where you're going to hit them. 
then you can go in against uh, another attack and the wicket's a little bit different. It, uh, the, every situation calls for a different approach. But I think, I've always found that if you're positive in whatever approach, whether it, you know, my, the best form of defence is attack, in my eyes. Um, some of the older critics might disagree with me. But uh, that's the way I've always played it, and that's the way I think it should be played. Then there's eight guys around the bat trying to catch you, and you've got a good bowler on. Well, if you do nick it, if you nick it hard, it flies. If you're just pushing forward, you're going to nick the same ball and get caught. When you're batting, and particularly batting well, what sort of a state are you in? It's been said you, you go into some sort of trance. Well, it's not just a trance. It's more a case... I suppose a trance is a good word, actually, I'm reflecting. Because it's a case I don't fight the instinct. You know, there's a great saying in England, you know, quite often the target will be, say, four runs and over. And the guy gets a half volley and he hits it for four. And the next ball from the same spot, but he blocks it because he gets four off the over. But when, when you're playing well, that doesn't happen. You know, you just play. It's, it's, as I said, keep on using this word, believe in the force. And that, that's, you know, it's the force of that bat. I mean, it's just what happens. Let the instinct carry you. In other words, when it's going well, you enjoy it. You ride the crest of the wave. You know, you, you know, when you're up, you're up. But when you're down, you can be down for a long time. So make the most of it when you're up. But when you're up, everything seems to fall into place. It just happens. What are your favourite shots? What do you most enjoy playing? I like driving the ball. I like cutting it and pulling it. I don't really mind, actually. It depends. You know, if Malcolm Marshall's bowling, I like to middle a few hook shots. But there again, quite often, he middles the centre of my head. But we see the lofted drive a lot with you. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, there's a lot of space out there. <laughs> Sometimes there's a feeling underneath. Oh, well, yeah, my theory is, well, perhaps the boundary's not quite far enough. <laughs> and the leg side includes that famous reverse sweep. I still think it's a very productive shot. Peter May doesn't agree with me. But there again, Peter and I perhaps don't agree on a lot of things anyway, regarding you know, where the game's played now, because the game is an aggressive game now. It, it is a game of... Uh, it's not a it's not a case of good morning the opposition it's oh right this lot let's have them and that's what the game's about when you get on the field Botham dressed for battle helmeted like everyone else his bat three pounds of best English willow specially made for him it's heavier than most Len Hutton once likened it to a railway sleeper this was his first century against Australia though unusually for Botham there weren't many people there to see it Despite losing the test, and the other two on this short tour, Botham rates this innings as among his best. 5,000 test runs have come off that Botham bat at an average of 35. There have been 14 centuries, centuries against everyone except the West Indies. The Oval 1982, the third test against India, Lammy made a century, you hit a double. Yeah. Third fastest nine. test double by an Englishman in history. That's your highest score in tests. Yep. It was a magnificent wicket to bat on. Lammy and I had a long partnership together. Um, it was a knock I enjoyed. Technically, it was probably one of my best knocks. <laughs> 200 anywhere is good, but you know, a test match is great. and. There was quite a few big sixes in that innings, actually. I'm reflecting back on it, and probably on reflection, the ball that I got out to, I could have hit it for six, but, yeah, one gets a bit bored after a while, yeah. And you were out off that reverse sweep? You don't mind. Uh, even be the maker and couldn't size one 200 legs <laughs> playing it, could he? His most recent test century was 138 against the old enemy in Brisbane in 1986. Border soon took the new ball, but that only provoked an onslaught. New balls don't stay new for long, with both of them in this mood. His century came after three and three quarter hours. A standing ovation for only the third Englishman ever to score a hundred at the Gabba. He celebrated with a blitz. A, it's nice to do it against the Australians, but it's even nicer to do it against them in their own country. It, it was a tremendous feeling, and it set up the serious victory. 
the end was as spectacular as the innings itself. A fine catch by Hughes, but already one man is dominating the clashes for the Ashes. Let's talk specifically for a minute or two about both of the bowling. Mm. Can you look back and, and think of any particular deliveries that, that will always be with you? Yeah, the best delivery I've bowled in Test cricket that's got a wicket. Haroon Rashid came in in 1978 at that game at Lord. Bond delivery that would have started leg stump if not outside leg stump and swung very late and caught the off stump and just not just flipped it out of the ground and it caught the outside of it so that ball has moved a good nine or ten inches very late. It was unplayable. I mean it would, it would have got any player out in the world and uh, it's a sort of delivery a swing ball that dreams about bowling. His figures that day should certainly have sent him to sleep happy. Bowling from the nursery end at Lord's, he returned a career best of 8 for 34. Pakistan was skittled out for 139. And strangely enough, this wasn't the first tail ender to get a peach of a late swinger from both of them. Well, actually, that was a bit of a waste, actually, from the old mate Jeff Thompson. Uh, I mean, up wouldn't mind me saying, I'm sure that it was well wasted on that delivery. I'm sure he can still remember it. And I think Tom, I was actually playing it over there somewhere as the old stump went out of the ground over here. But it, that was definitely wasted on up. Were you actually trying to bowl the away swinger? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was my stuck to delivery in those days. Yeah. Then they changed the cricket ball and it wouldn't swing so much for quite a few years. That's another story. What about your 100th test wicket then? That was 1979. So Lord Gavaska at Lord's. He just fended the ball outside of the stump and Mike really has to a very, very good catch at first night. And I, I had, a, I'd had a weird dream the night before. And I'd actually dreamt that Sunil would be my wicket. And as it turned out, the following day I found out, talking to Sunil, that he'd had a similar premonition, that he would be my 100th wicket in that game, which I thought was rather weird. You know, afterwards, I'm reflecting. It's the sort of thing that if either of you said to the other one afterwards, the other one would think, well, he's only saying that because of what I've said. But we said it at different times, and it was, it was quite strange. You have, or you certainly had a reputation of being a difficult man for a captain to get the ball off if, if things were going right. Well, no one minds bowling when you're getting wickets. And uh, I seem to have a phenomenal strike rate at that time. My time, you know, when you're young and everything's sound and the body's strong, you know, my thoughts were, well, the best way of getting wickets is to bowl. And uh, um, Mike really in particular used to let me virtually have a free reign in that department. You know, he had to pull me off once or twice if I was bowling badly. It does encourage me to bowl. Bertham now has 373 test wickets, a record shared with Hadley of New Zealand. You've often taken a wicket with, with a, a first loose man. Oh, you? yeah. I mean, I've got 373 wickets in test cricket. I think 200 of them are off bad balls. And I think uh, that would be about par. But, yeah, the good balls, they don't hit. Unless you hit the stumps, it, it misses everything. It's too good. And it's usually the innocuous ball I can remember getting Jeff Howarth. Um, I think he got 100 in the first innings at the Oval, and he was on about 97 in the second innings on a flat oval wicket. And I thought, I'll try the slower ball. And it turned out to be a great big long hop down the leg side. And I mean, so slow, it was ridiculous. He had the time to have a cup of tea, decide where he wanted to hit it. And he smashed this, and Phil Edmonds at backward square jumped out and it stuck. <laughs> and poor old Jeff Howarth, he looked for a hole to bury himself in. I told the lads, Slow ball, didn't yeah. <laughs> which I took a lot of stick for. Ian Botham's vital contribution to one of the most thrilling of test matches was another so-so delivery. England needed only one wicket, and Thompson, the tail ender, was their target. He survived two overs from yesterday's hero Cowans, but only just. The crowd of 10,000 put nail-bitten hands together to applaud every ball, every run. Tomo almost looked more confident than Border, the man who was trying to shield him. Though, like any number 11, he was taking chances. His captain, Chapel, could hardly bear the strain. Another run. Australia now needed only 30 to win, and still no wicket fell. Cowans took the new ball. Surely that would do the trick. The fielding was sharp, but Australia kept scampering the runs. The 50 partnership came up as they inched nervously nearer to the impossible. There's a chance for three here, I would say. Now England's fielders were getting themselves in a twist. And Border's gone. And oh, and 
in their rush to get it at Jeff Thompson, who was not backing up. Another two, and Border had his 50. Only 20 now to win or to lose. And very well run. An hour gone, and they were still there. Tomo lashed two past the flying guard, 12 to win. Six needed. It was desperate stuff. The crowd were near hysteria, and England nearly frantic. Then both them bowled to Thompson. The snick shot to Tavares, twitching hands. Up flew the ball, but Miller was there, and England had won by just three runs. Delirium for England, despair for Australia. It was a fittingly extraordinary end to one of the most incredible test matches ever witnessed. And most important, England were back in the ashes. It's always good to beat the Australians in Australia. You keep saying that, is it? That they are the old enemy for you. Oh, shit, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no comparison, I mean, England and Australia, that's what it all about. They still call us Pommy now. I've worked that, never worked that out, because Pommy, from what I can define, is prisoner of Mother England. And that's them, not us. <laughs> <laughs> No, they're a great country. The other Australians just look like his country, big and empty. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to do this speech a, bit the, now, aren't we? Yeah, this is actually aimed at all my friends in uh, <laughs> Australia. They know how to take it as well, because they'll be laughing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the first time they've heard it, either. <laughs> <laughs> I love fielding. You know, if you go out and you, know, you achieve your ultimate and you're out there and there's a big arena, there might be... Um, 100,000 at Melbourne, all baying for your blood. Yeah, and you're out there, stood out there, and you've got this atmosphere, and you know, you know that you can upset the whole of this lot who've been giving you abuse for the last four hours by taking one diving catch off their hero. Uh, it, you know, it's the same thing. Fielding's a very important part of the game. And over the years, you know, I've worked hard at being a slip fielder. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed it. I've developed my own style. I watch the ball. I don't watch the bat. A lot of guys watch the bat. Well, I think if you're watching the bat, you know, there's a lot of times you're going to be like this and you're staying down and tensed up. Whereas if you just watch the ball, you, you, you're not really seeing what the batsman's doing. You're watching the ball and then you can see, you know, you, it, you can anticipate to a degree. But, uh, yeah, it's basically reflexes. I think it's been relaxed. Yeah. And that's why I like to keep my hands on my knees, because I feel relaxed. I'm not there all tensed up waiting for the ball. I'm relaxed. Hands are on the knees. I'm sat there and just waiting, you know, and if it comes my way, it comes. Only Colin Cadre has taken more slip catches for England than Botham. Botham's scalp count is 109. You can't actually define what is the best because Different things in different periods of times or different situations mean different things mm. to you. Um, in actual fact, I suppose the best catch I've ever taken was off Burn Bowling against Alden Calatran in the West Indies at uh, Adelaide. What a magnificent catch by Ian Botham. Superb, he said, and even Kelly Curran is applauding the catch. Superlatives have been exhausted by the commentators this summer, but if there's a better catch in the series, I'll eat my son hat. 1985 proved to be a vintage year for Ian Botham, and there was almost a sense of déjà vu. As in 1977 and 81, the Australians lost at Headingley, with Botham serving up a quick-fire 60. This was the season he hit a record 86s. Bowlers didn't seem to like it. Yeah, you have years where it's like a good wine. You know, there's certain years that everything just goes right. And this, this is one of those years. I mean, every time I played an aggressive shot, it seemed to come off. Uh, I scored a hat full of runs. I think I averaged uh, virtually 100 for Somerset in first-class cricket that year. Everything I did, or attempted to do, came off. I think that was the same series, I think, when I walked out and hit uh, Craig McDermott to Edgerston, walked out and hit the first ball. I walked out, my first ball, the innings, I stepped away and hit him out of the ground straight. And then did it on the third ball I faced, because we'd had a score a hat for. And I had, went in with full license from the captain, Mike Gaines, to go, you know, do what you like. And I got a standing ovation, which I thought was <laughs> rather marvellous. At 400 and odd, I got a standing ovation for 17. 
In contrast, nothing quite went right for Ian Botham in 1986. It was bad enough venturing out to bat in a coconut shy, but Botham evidently felt additionally oppressed by what he saw as unjustified newspaper attacks. He averaged just 17 with the bat, and his wicket-taking was expensive. Sex and drug allegations by a Sunday newspaper, despite a flat denial by Botham, just increased his contempt for the press. I don't mind anyone criticising me for uh, cricket. Fine. I'm professional, I accept that. That's part of the job. If you do something, well, fine. But uh, to make allegations and accusations like this, I think, are A, totally unfounded. B, I find it amazing that you know, pe people are so inhuman. Um, as to even make such suggestions like that. It just seems that everything I do, people are going out of their way to try and knock down. He is capable still of the most dazzling cricket, and that's what I'd like to see from him. And we're not going to get that from Ian. If in, not in the back of his mind, but in the forefront of his mind, he has got the sort of stinging criticism that has winged its way across the wires ringing in his ears, and that's, that's doing nobody any good at all. They can throw as much mud as they want, and that seems to be what the present trend is. But I just wish they'd stop and remember that they have children at school, you know, my ch two children at school, my wife's at home with the baby. Uh, they're on their own 4,000 miles away, and when they get people knocking on their doors, asking them about things that are as crazy as that, I'm sure this will all be sorted out in two or three days. It just amazes me that uh, it ever appeared in the paper in the first place. Does all this depress you? It does, yeah. It sickens me to the court, absolutely. Botham's heart didn't really seem to be in it. Malcolm Marshall took his wicket five times in the series. Touring has taken a very bitter twist to me since that last West Indies yeah. tour. Uh, I actually thought, well, I mean, they've thrown everything at me now. What the hell's going to come on the next tour? And I thought, well, I think time's to get out now. I don't need it anymore. I don't need that kind of heartache anymore. Things got worse before they got better. Admitting to smoking cannabis brought a temporary ban from playing. Oh, you oh. had a two-month suspension because of a, the, uh, I think it was Nick Because I said I smoked some cannabis. Oh, yeah. dear, dear, terrible. Yeah. Stop the world. <laughs> Hanging. So they gave me a two-month ban, I, fair enough. I went and learned to fly a helicopter, which I enjoyed immensely. And then um, I came back, and eventually the ball got thrown to me, and there was a magnificent buzz around the ground. As soon as I got the ball, there was sort of hush as I started my run-up. And I came in, the first ball, put this, bang this in the short left, and Bruce Edgar followed it, edged it to Ducci, did a little bit of a juggling out, got it under control, first ball back, tremendous. and. Uh, it was quite running because I turned straight to the England dressing room where I knew the England selectors were sat. And I just, great delight, it was there, the wicket, you know, that's, I'm back. And you equaled um, Dennis Lilly's record number of test wickets. That was that ball, I think, equaled yeah. it. And the next one, uh, Jeff Crow, head LBW, to take the record. Very fond memories. In fact, actually, I can remember Graham Gooch coming up to me uh, just after that had happened, after he caught the first ball, and he just came up to me and he said, Roth, he says, uh, it's beefy, he says, uh, who writes your scripts? And that was all he said. And I thought, it was a very good line. Even by his own standards, Botham also excelled with the bat in this test. <laughs> One could be forgiven for thinking that somebody up there liked him again. The wicketkeeper, Tony Blaine, might well despair. Botham went on to hit the fastest Test 50 on record off just 32 balls. <laughs> One over by Sterling was thumped for 24 runs, another Test record. During his career, Botham has had his differences with the cricket establishment. I can remember walking through Lords the Long Room and this gentleman going, Botham. And I thought, bugger you, I've got a handle to my name. And he just goes, Botham, come here. And I thought, you arrogant, pompous old watson. And 
In the end, I just turned around to this gentleman and I said, excuse me, either Ian or Mr. And I just walked off. Mm. And there's no need for that. And that's one of the things that's changing a bit in the game, which I like. Because we're now seeing, you know, you go to Old Trafford and you've got the members there. They're, they are humorous and they're good fun. Yeah. They're great people, the Lancastrians. They, they, they enjoy the game. They're dance like more knowledge, knowledgeable than that crowd at Lords. They know the game by far back there. They know, they know the game. They don't know what they read in their MCC book. There's a big difference. When we're talking about discipline in cricket, is it your view that it's being imposed by the wrong sort of people in the wrong sort of way? I think, basically, I've just been too honest. You know, I, I can remember going to a disciplinary hearing, and I was uh, on one of the charges. And I walked into this room, and one of the people in, the, in that uh, meeting actually sat there and said, well, I said, I'd like to show the footage of this to back my case up. And the guy, one of the guys who was going to give me a fair and independent hearing said, well, there's no point, obviously guilty, let's get on with it. And I thought, well... Yeah. Doesn't you increase go. your respect for them. Well, I mean, what the hell is the point in worrying about it, yeah, really? Botham's other bête noire, not least after the 86 West Indies tour, remains the media. The genuine cricket writers I always uh, be prepared to talk to the sleazy um, Fleet Street rat bags who turn up mm. their $30 suits and their greased back hair. Um, they, as far as I'm concerned, are the just low forms of life. Mm. And there's just no point in worrying about them. They have no scruples, they have no principles, they have no uh, conscience. Um, checkbook journalism mm. doesn't worry me in the least because at the end of the day, you know, they can only throw so much at the public before at the end of the day the public have had enough as well. You obviously feel a lot of resentment that, that you have been treated badly. In the I would just like to get hold of a few of those editors just for 10 minutes. Mm. I feel a lot better, man. But maybe if I make enough money, we'll do a few investigations into them and see what skeletons they've got in their closet. Because yeah. that might make even better even. But, you know, I think, I think it was the son who called you a foul-mouthed slob. I mean, do you ever behave like a foul-mouthed slob? Or do you ever who called me? The, the son, son called yeah. me a foul-mouthed slob. Yeah, I mean, do you, ever, do you ever feel that there might be some justification in that? I don't really take a lot of notice of anything the son says, to be quite frank. Um, I don't take a lot of notice of any papers, to be, to be perfectly honest. I, I've made a point most of my life of not reading the newspapers, good or bad. Yeah. And I think that's the safest, otherwise you'll get a totally dis... You'll think, well, hang on a minute, was I there or not? Because that doesn't read the way it happened. Yeah. So when a newspaper says, uh, you are a foul-mouthed slob, um, fine, they're entitled to their opinion. Mm. Uh, but I think I know who carries most uh, credence in this country, me or the Sun newspaper. I don't think there's too much of a competition. Ian Botham would be the first to admit he's no saint. In 1985, he was no-balled and warned for intimidatory bowling by umpire Alan Whitehead. And tempers frayed further when Ritchie was caught by Edmonds at third man off another no-ball. If you look through the history of my test career, I think you can count the no-balls that I've bowled on one hand. I wonder how many of those Alan's called. It was really a case of the wrong place, wrong time for both of us. I don't think I was solely wrong. I don't think he was solely wrong. I think it was a case of perhaps the two of us being a little bit aggressive towards each other at the wrong time. Yeah. The 1987 series, won by Pakistan, also had its volatile moments. That was a series that England, in my opinion, uh, should never have lost. Um, I, th I think that there was some tremendously bad um, sportsmanship, shall we say. Mm. Uh, mainly, I have to say, from the opposition. It was not a series I enjoyed. Away from cricket, Ian Botham has walked over 1,500 miles to raise money for leukaemia research. It began in 1985 with a walk from John O'Groats to Land's End. It took Botham and party five weeks of foot slogging to make it, but make it they did. Everything from pocket money to company sponsorship, at least one and a half million pounds was raised through this and subsequent walks. And you feel the sense of, of, of giving something back for what yeah, sport has... Yeah, it's very easy to keep on taking. I mean, it, you know, sport's been lucky to me. I could have, 
I could be one of those kids at 22 or 23. You know, it happens to 23-year-olds as well. You know, mm -hmm. Suddenly overnight, they've got leukemia. And it could have happened to me, that hasn't. I could have had cancer, I could have had a, you know, a road accident, anything. I've been very lucky. You know, anyone can write a check out and send it off. By the time it gets to where you actually want it to get, there's probably two and six of that check left. So my attitude was, instead of doing that, you know, let's get on and do something ourselves. Let's, let me do it. Let me suffer for it. And then if people want to donate through what idiotic walk I want to do, or whatever, then fine. And it's, it really snowballed. The friendship and rivalry with Viv Richards is another integral part of Ian Botham's life. Viv's the closest friend I've got. I mean, Viv and I go back to the days we started at Somerset. He's godfather to my son. Uh, I see a lot of him. Um, a lot of my success I owe to Viv because of the strength of mind he's given me. Well, I've even been playing against Viv, and I've been going through a bad time. And he's said, come on, we're going to have a drink that evening. We're going to sit down and have a few glasses of rum or whatever in the West Indies, and we'll talk about what I was doing wrong. Which I think that's the sign of friendship when you're playing against each other and you can still do it. Without any bottom in the West Indies here, in your team, I think most certainly we feel a little bit more relaxed and knowing that you know we haven't got to, to, to bowl to such a dynamite man. But he's definitely your best cricketer. You know, we put the sweaters on, well, I've got the three lions on and the crown, he's got the Caribbean sweater on, I mean, that's it, you know, it's war. But when the sweaters come off at six o'clock in the evening, well, we can be mates then, can we? So is Ian Botham, as some people say, the greatest all-rounder ever? You're proud of what you've achieved, but at the end of the day, if Richard Hadley has 30 wickets than me when we both retire, 30 wickets more, tremendous. Well done, Richard. I know he'll never have 14 test hundreds that I've got. I know Imran Khan will never have 14 test hundreds. And Imran Khan will never have the wickets that I've got. But I've been privileged to play against some of the greatest all-rounders in an era, in a decade. I think at the end of it, if I could remember as the best all-rounder, that would do me. And if I'm not, well, just to be one of those four would be great. And people will always have their own opinions. I mean, you'll have the whole of Pakistan saying Imran's the best, you'll have the whole of New Zealand. Yeah, so I'm fine. Yeah, that, that suits me. But to be even in that last four all-rounders, that's an honour in itself, so I'm quite content. Well, you might have the whole of the cricket world saying, really, the best all-rounder was Gary Sobers. Well... Gary Sowers, you know, I would say that my choice would be Gary Sowers. He was a complete all-rounder. Um, it's only because they don't allow me to bowl my off spin. The test careers of the two great men didn't overlap, but there was a charity game at the Oval in 1982. Gary came out to a great ovation. They immediately put me on to bowl, so I came in, and it was all very gentle stuff. And Gary hadn't got too many, but he got this ball for me that hit on the length and literally went underground. And the only way he could not have been out was to go under the wicket. That's how low it came. And uh, hit the base of the stump, and I just looked at the guy and I said, oh, my God, what can I do? It didn't deserve a wicket, the ball. It was not intended to get a wicket. But there again, that's probably similar to a lot of my cricket anyway, so... Someone said, I don't know who, that uh, you've made it clear that you're going to retire in 1990. Did I? <laughs> um, I haven't even considered retirement, to be honest, Leonard. It hasn't even, it hasn't even crossed my mind. Um, I think you know when it's time to retire. I don't think you can plan when you're going to retire. Mm -hmm. I think there's a day when you go out there and you suddenly realise, oh, I didn't pick that up too well. Or I didn't see that too well. Or, you know, I missed that one. That, one, that ball's hit the fence before I've even moved to catch it. There's a time will tell you. you know, nature tells you. Uh, I'm waiting for that to come. It hasn't come yet. <laughs> Position with your wham bam sound. Got a single 
1978, 12th of August, Trent Bridge, second test against New Zealand. England again win by an innings of 119. You took nine for 93 in the match overall, and boycott hit a century. Do you remember much about that game? That's a pretty good average, nine for 93. No, I don't. Six know. for 34. In what the date was that one? <laughs> that was 12th of August, 1978, Trent Bridge. No, I don't remember much about that at all. Good. Well, let's go then. To, uh, <laughs> get that one right. <laughs> Forget that. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> no, I can't remember that, that one. <laughs> oh, unless that we was only like... won by an innings and God knows what. I think it might, be when I, uh, might have been when I hit another good friend of mine, Jeff Howe, from the head. I think it was. <laughs>